We all know Argentina, simultaneously one of the wealthiest and brokest nations of South America. A nation that was once considered the United States of Latin America, before falling into economic despair and political upheaval for much of the modern era. Today, we're going to fix that. We're going to go back to the founding of Argentina, exploring their territorial and geopolitical goals, discussing what if everything went perfect for Argentina. Prior to their independence, Argentina had been a part of the extensive Spanish Empire, specifically being a part of the Viceroyalty of Rio de la Plata, including controlling the colony's capital, Buenos Aires. This Viceroyalty included parts of modern-day Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Bolivia, Paraguay, and even some border territories which are now Brazilian. Yet, despite this officially very large vice royalty, in practice it wasn't really that united. Infrastructure in the region was lacking, with mountains and jungles making communication far more difficult. There were several powerful cities with little unity between them. The region known as Upper Peru, surprisingly, was economically and politically closer to Peru than to the rest of Rio de la Plata. Beyond that, Paraguay was uniquely isolated from the rest of the vice royalty, and within the rest, cities like Montevideo and Cordoba loved to compete with the official capital. But this situation would soon be radically changed. As Napoleon ran rampant across Europe, he would eventually invade Spain and Portugal, starting the Peninsular War. Both Charles IV and his son Ferdinand VII would be captured and imprisoned by Napoleon as his own brother, Joseph, was installed on the Spanish throne instead. Within Spain, a guerrilla war began, as forces loyal to the king fought to evict the French occupiers, attempting to write a constitution and create a counter-government. But this new government would soon see military reverses, reducing their legitimacy in claiming to represent a true Spanish government. All of this severely impacted the Spanish colonial empire, Pretty much nobody recognized the legitimacy of the Napoleonic monarchy, but few too desired to listen to the rump government either, especially since it wasn't even headed by the king himself. So, if the regions of Spain proper could rule themselves in absence of the king, then why couldn't the colonies do the same? All across Spanish America, juntas, local or regional governments were established. These new juntas would still be loyal to Ferdinand VII as the King of Spain, but until he was restored, more and more autonomy would be claimed by the colonial regime. During this, most colonies would also start to balkanize, as most major cities preferred their own autonomy rather than diverting to one of the official capitals. During this, Argentina was one of the first to take a more radical step. They deposed their viceroy, and the government in Buenos Aires took matters into their own hands. Even now though, they hadn't yet declared independence from Spain, still claiming to rule in name of Ferdinand. What really helped Buenos Aires was an earlier British attempt at conquering the region, occupying the city. After being pushed back by colonial forces, the city would organize a citizen's militia, with everybody able to carry a weapon being armed just in case the British came back which they soon would, getting defeated at Buenos Aires and once more being kicked from the region. This relatively solid military foundation would allow them to join up with several other anti-Spanish juntas, some by conquest, some by choice, as the United Provinces of South America were created, later renamed the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata. This new state though was still surrounded by regions loyal to the Viceroy. This initial war wasn't necessarily one for independence, as there were generally two camps across Spanish America. The Royalists wanted to follow the rump government still present in Spain, while the Patriots preferred self-rule until the king was returned. Yet, as the conflict intensified, many Patriots began to like the idea of complete independence. Now this war of independence is key to our story. In our timeline, Paraguay would secure their own independence, while the Spanish inflicted a crippling blow to Argentine control over Upper Peru, causing Argentina to become independent with far less territory than they had previously claimed. 
Then, arguably more importantly, we also need to fix Argentina's early political disputes. Already in 1816, long before Spain was even fully defeated, Argentina would have their first civil war, which Brazil would use to weaken the state. Once that was resolved, infighting between Argentina's provinces became very common, as each province essentially had their own military. By 1826, yet another civil war broke out, and after that was over, a new one started only a year later, ending the United Provinces of Rio de la Plata and starting the Argentine Confederation. Of course, this new state too immediately fought a civil war. For anyone keeping track, that's a new civil war starting every four and a half years between 1814 and 1831. Now the essence of these civil wars was very simple. The future of Argentina's state model. The first option was centralization, where Buenos Aires as capital, largest city and wealthiest port would practically dominate the new state. Most other regions, very naturally, preferred a more federate model, where the profits from Buenos Aires' foreign trade would be spread out across the nation and each province held significant autonomy. The main person to watch in this early struggle was José Gervasia Artigas. He was one of the largest supporters of federalism, creating the Federalist League in the East. And despite a Brazilian invasion of his allies, he would manage to win the civil war and impose a federalist constitution on the nation. Sadly, after this victory, Argentina was arguably too decentralized, leaving the nation in political turmoil for decades, as provinces failed to unite against foreign threats and even fought amongst themselves. That leaves us with a very troubling dilemma. If we go with centralization, the state would be internally divided, which is an issue, especially if we want to create a larger Argentina. Conversely, if federalism is implemented wrong like it was in our timeline, we have the risks of decades of conflict, as there isn't enough national cohesion to unite the nation, especially as Buenos Aires' opposition to it would weaken the state. And, again, the population and economic heart of the nation, this is a major issue. I'm sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you are subscribed. To keep up to date with all the latest releases, consider doing so. Thank you. Now perhaps there is a singular issue to both of these problems. Have the Argentinians be far more successful during their war of independence? Two main military operations were launched in our timeline. One against Paraguay and one against Upper Peru. Let's first discuss the Paraguayan campaign. Like mentioned, Paraguay had been a relatively isolated region and they had little loyalty to the new Argentine project, nor were they interested in submission to Spain. But the Argentine attempted conquest of the region was very flawed. They had assumed the Paraguayans would simply rise up against the Spanish the moment a minor army was sent. This would lead to a battle where the Spanish and the Paraguayans outnumbered the Argentinians by three to one, leading to Argentina retreating, leaving Paraguay alone, allowing them to go their own way. But this campaign was not due. While smaller, the Argentine army was better supplied and armed, and some historians have argued that if the Argentines hadn't retreated, they could have achieved victory. It is very much not unthinkable that if Argentina had been more properly prepared and sent more forces to the invasion, the Argentinian conquest of Paraguay could have succeeded. Of course, this does not ensure that Paraguay can't cause trouble later, but at least it firmly establishes Paraguay as part of the Argentinian sphere. Next up is the campaign over Upper Peru. The region had so far seen their own revolutions being crushed by the royalists, which were now pushing against the United Provinces' territory there. Juan José Castelli would lead the southern counteroffensive, initially achieving victories in the region creating a government in Chuquisaca and implementing a whole host of reforms, aimed at liberating the natives and the slaves of the region and reforming administration. But the campaign would break down over disagreements on its future. Castelli had argued that he should invade southern Peru, one of Peru's most economically important regions. The hope was that this could destabilize the royalists in the region, 
reducing their ability to mount further counteroffensives, thus potentially ending the war in the region. But the government in Buenos Aires rejected this idea, thinking it was too risky. Instead, a temporary truce was established in the region. A truce happily used by the royalists to reorganize their forces and launch a surprise invasion themselves. The Argentine armies would be devastated, losing their artillery and seeing mass desertion, eventually dooming Argentina's control over the region. For Argentina to have any hope at victory here, they need to swallow the risk and invade Peru. Not only does this weaken the region, it also means they now have far more strategic depth to retreat into. Besides this, the city of Tacna had been planning a revolution of their own, which could further bolster the Argentine invasion and potentially escalate into further revolts into Peru, which, in the best case scenario, could destroy the Spanish presence in the region far, far earlier. Yes, it is absolutely a risky operation, and no, it is not guaranteed to succeed. But Argentina faced a complete military disaster in our timeline anyways. Trying this strategy can either lead to a much stronger position for Argentina, or we simply return to our own timeline. Considering that this is a perfect video, we're obviously assuming the first, cementing Argentine control over Upper Peru, while cementing a friendly regime in Peru proper. With the Declaration of Independence of Chile and the conquest of Montevideo, most of the Spanish presence in southern South America is over. Interestingly, this can also have major effects up north, as rather than a Gran Colombia liberating Ecuador, we might see Peru march north instead. Either way, the threat of Spain on Argentina is heavily reduced, while Peruvian-Colombian conflicts likely keep Peru from threatening their northern border in the short term. Now obviously, the changes we have now introduced in the timeline are massive. Just look at the comparison between our timeline's United Provinces and what it is now. Quite potentially, exactly because it is now much larger, the political problems of the young state could be easier solved. Why? Because the city and province of Buenos Aires will be substantially less powerful, relatively speaking, as the Federalist League of our timeline will undoubtedly reach an alliance with the Paraguayan province, and likely the upper Peruvian ones too. This makes a Federalist victory, whether via politics or a short civil war, far easier to accomplish. Now it is difficult to dive into the specifics of alternate politics, but at the very least, we have laid a far more solid foundation for a large, federal, Argentine state, basing their new government largely on the United States. But our job isn't fully done. During this time, Brazil, or actually, the United Kingdom of Portugal, Brazil, and the Algarves invaded the eastern provinces. They did this in an attempt to cripple what could swiftly become a rival in the region, as well as to combat the republican ideals of the new state. Considering just how much stronger Argentina has become, an early conflict between the two states is quite likely. Now I don't want you to get the wrong idea here. This alternate Argentina is still way, way weaker than Brazil initially. Even if we go by the higher estimates, Argentina would at best have about half the Brazilian population. Thus, such a Brazilian invasion, especially if successful, risks further conflicts destroying the federation. Now luckily, there is good news. Brazil would launch this invasion during the first Argentine civil war. If we assume that we prevented this, or left it much shorter, a Brazilian intervention would carry a lot more risk, as they'd be fighting across a much larger front line against a far stronger Argentina. Now having prevented this conflict would already be great, but it gets better as Brazil at the time had quite similar issues to Argentina regarding centralization or federalization, which would eventually lead to the Raga Muffin War, where the Rio Grande's Republic attempted to first reform Brazil into a federation, before switching to fighting for independence from Brazil. This war could be key to Argentinian success against their rival. How we get there doesn't really matter too much. We could have Uruguay initially lost to Brazil, 
only for Argentina to recover it during this war, or we could have it not be lost at all. More important is that when this war breaks out, Argentina is in a position to intervene and can support the Rio Grande's Republic in achieving their independence. If we want to go really extreme, we could have other independence movements also successfully break Brazil, but by that point, we are really stretching realism and the impact that Argentina can have on these conflicts. Still, the independence of the Rio Grande's Republic is quite an important pickup for Argentina, as it now becomes a buffer state between the nations, with Brazil facing a national humiliation, potentially further weakening their main rival. Now the final change that I'd like to make in this video regards Argentine control over the Falkland Islands. It used to be claimed by Spain as well as Britain, but neither had real, solid control over it. During the Napoleonic Wars, what was left of European control had practically left. Now Argentina would take over the Spanish claim, and also took over a minor Spanish port on the island. But when American ships wanted to fish in the region, the Argentine representative attempted to arrest them, leading to the United States sending an operation to the island, destroying much of Argentine control on the island. A year later, the same thing happened, and America considered a second expedition. To prevent this, Britain restored their own claim to the island, something the Argentines are upset about to this very day. If we assume a relatively minor change, with Argentina granting America some whaling rights around the island, it is very possible that America could recognize Argentina's control of the island, keeping it safe from Britain under the American Monroe Doctrine, as, let's face it, the Falklands aren't really worth upsetting the Americans over. This may actually be the most important change of this entire timeline, as let's be honest, how can any Argentina ever be perfect without the Falklands? Now around here, I will leave this scenario. We have set up Argentina in a very solid position. They control a large amount of South America, with Chile and the Rio Grande's Republic largely dependent on their neighbor. In the decades following, we would see Argentina solidify their control over Patagonia, and if we want to get really detailed, these territories were claimed by both Chile and Argentina, so let's give them to Argentina as well. Now, by nature, this is a very optimistic scenario, but I have to end with a pretty serious disclaimer. We have put a plaster on Argentina's political issues through this federal model, but that is not a guarantee of permanent success. While it works for America, it required solid state building and men who believed in the project they were undertaking. It is absolutely possible that rather than this positive vision of the scenario, Brazil makes use of the disunity of the nation to expand, while Argentina seeks secession and Peruvian and Chilean invasions rock the state, with the federal government too weak to prevent these outcomes. But assuming Argentina does weather these storms, and they continue to democratize and develop, then they are set up for greatness. Even in our timeline, they were the wealthiest South American nation. This would be even more true now they would be in an excellent position to soak up a significant amount of European settlers, further increasing their population and power, closing the gap to Brazil over time. Do I think that this alternate Argentina would be a superpower on the scale of America or Britain? Well, not quite. But they would be a considerable great power in the region, their influence on the entire continent undeniable. For now though, this is the end of the video. Thank you all for watching and consider leaving a like and a comment as well as subscribing. If you've enjoyed this video, click the video on top to watch another in this series. And if you've already seen it, then I'm sure that the bottom video is great too. Once again, thank you for watching and goodbye.